friends, my name's Nicole and if you're new to my channel, welcome and today I am here to talk to you about the Broadway revival of Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma is a show that I have a little bit of a complicated history with. I grew up watching the movie obsessively. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. You know, Annie was my favorite character and then I got a bit older and I was like, I hate Oklahoma. Um, I think it's an incredibly problematic show, uh, mostly in terms of the fact that like everyone in it is like a really bad person and it's never really kind of dealt with most of the time. Um, so whenever they announced the Oklahoma revival, I like wasn't that thrilled about it, but it was at it St. Anne's Warehouse and then I started hearing that it was kind of this new reimagined Oklahoma. Um, and I'm sure you've seen all the stuff about it, you know, online like being not your grandmother's Oklahoma and whoever on Twitter it was that came up with the whole like this Oklahoma they were correct. So I finally bought into the hype, largely due to Natalie Walker's tweets, and decided I was going to go see it. I booked myself a ticket, and I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. I never thought I'd be obsessed with the Oklahoma revival. It's incredible. I actually am going to see it again. <laughs> I bought myself a ticket to see it from the front row, not like the table seats that they have, but um, in the curved bit in the front there. And I'm going to see that in a couple of weeks, and I'm so excited to get up close and personal with Oklahoma. <laughs> when I told someone that I was going to see Oklahoma, they were like, I was like, I'm going to Oklahoma. And they were like, Why are you, what are you going to Oklahoma for? And I had to clarify that I'm at the Broadway show and not the state. And it's funny because like, it just never occurred to me. If someone said they're going to Oklahoma, I would assume they were going to see it on Broadway. So I have my notes here. Also, I'd like to apologize if you can hear people outside my window or cars. That's living in New York City. I'm giving you the full New York experience. I will say that this review is going to probably have some mild spoilers for Oklahoma. I figure it's a musical that premiered in the 1940s, so I should be able to say some spoilers. If you don't know the plot of Oklahoma and you don't want to find out, like, maybe you don't watch. Um, but if you have any kind of familiarity with Oklahoma and you kind of know what's going on, then feel free to continue. So first of all, I would like to address the fact that Oklahoma gives out free food during intermission, and I love nothing more than free food, and I love a show with a shtick, and they, during intermission, they um, literally bring out like big things of like vegan chili and cornbread, and you line up, and you get in line for your cornbread, and a wind tour was spotted in the chili and cornbread line, and I managed to make it to the bathroom and back and get my cornbread, so like worry not, they do stay out there for most of intermission with it, and it's delicious. Like I like chili anyways, but this chili is just full of vegetables, and it's like vegan, and it's so good, and the cornbread's amazing. They give it to you in a little cup, and you get your spoon, and you can take it back to your seat, and I'm obsessed. I mean, I'm not going to see it again because I want more of that chili, but like it was something that I considered. And if anybody knows where I could get that recipe, please hit a girl up. Let me know in the comments or on Twitter because I want to make a good vegan chili now. So like I mentioned before, Oklahoma was at St. Anne's Warehouse out in Brooklyn and it has moved onto Broadway in Circle in the Square. Um, some things that have been there in the recent past are, I believe, Fun Home and most recently uh, Once on This Island was there. It is the theater that if my beloved Grinning Man ever comes to Broadway, I would like to see it go into. But basically it's a, it's a thrust um, with seating like on three sides of the stage area and there aren't really that many seats in it. I don't know the number, but it f it feels like there's no seat in there that isn't like a good seat because no matter where you sit, you're quite up close and intimate with the audience. And the way that they've done the lighting, you know, you are like the entire audience is lit most of the time, except there are some scenes that are in total blackout, which is incredible. But you can like see the audience across from you and you also know that the performers can see you, which makes it a kind of, Think with a show like Oklahoma that is so much about community, it really adds to that feeling of you feeling you're, you're kind of part of the show, um, and also getting to see like other people's reactions. Like the day that I'm filming this, which I'm filming this a bit in advance, um, Nicole Kidman is there, and I'm not gonna lie to you, if I saw Nicole Kidman at Oklahoma, I might like watch Nicole Kidman watch Oklahoma, because um, that seems like it would be very fun. But yeah, I think that that's like a really cool part of it is that like in parts where you're shocked or you're horrified or whatever, you can see it kind of reflected on the rest of the audience's faces. There's also, as I hinted at earlier, table seating. So like in front of the front row on two of the sides, there are tables lined up with chairs at them and you can sit there if you pay a lot of money. And like there's a few parts where people like dance on the tables or like uh, Will Parker like lies down on one of them at one point. Like it, it would 
you be pretty up close and personal with it. Like you're, it's it's kind of like I think it's even more involved than like stage seating for Great Comet. Like it, it's 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 in it. It's in the action. So I want to talk about some of the technical stuff first before I move on to like performances and these costumes by um, Therese Wadden, Wadden, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, um, are incredible. Both the female and the male costumes, I really like that it's kind of a contemporary costume piece but very western so you kind of get that, um, you know, frontier vibes from it I guess still. And I really like that they've, they're they doing kind of modern costuming but being kind of ambiguous about like they haven't like updated anything else in it um, that much. Like they haven't changed any of the language or anything like that, which I really like. But the costuming makes it feel so much more modern. And I love that Lori starts out in kind of like a flannel and, and jeans, I think it is. And then whenever she changes into her party dress, it's like this big transformation, uh, which is kind of cute. I also have to say, Curly's white suit at the end, I was like, Oh my god. Most of the men in the show, like both Curly and Will Parker, are wearing chaps for most of it, um, which I don't think I'd ever seen on Broadway stage before. And I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed the chaps. They, they look nice. Um, but that white suit at the end, man, like, it just creates such a stark contrast, I think, to so much around it. But the costumes just overall are really incredible. I mentioned before that the lighting is really good, and it's done by Scott... Ooh, Zelinsky? Sorry if I said that wrong. Most of the time like everything is lit but then there will be these some like weird sequences in like green light and then there's a few scenes that are done in complete blackout. So like the scene between Judd and Curly um, and Judd's like shed is done in complete blackout and then they bring in like this camera guy and he like films them and really close up and they project it on this the back wall of the theater and okay I never thought that there would be like homoerotic subtext between Judd and Curly but somehow there is in this production and I'm here for it uh, but I thought that all of that was really brilliant. The way that they use the camera and like occasionally projecting footage on the on the wall is really incredible. And I think, let's see, the camera work and projection design is by Joshua Thorson. So just incredible, really blew me away. Um, but there's like the scene between Laurie and Judd at the, uh, like the basket auction, I don't know what to call that, the social, is also done in blackout. Um, and you just kind of like, hear them and somehow like just hearing the sounds of it and like of them kissing and whatever makes it worse in a way like I think it's a really cool choice to do it like that. I will say that the one thing in it that I'm not crazy about is the dream ballet. I have never been crazy about the dream ballet in Oklahoma and this really updates it. It's very modern. It's one dancer. She has this amazing like sparkly like t-shirt dress that says dream baby dream on it which I want. I would wear it. I was gonna say to the club. I've I've been to like two clubs in my life, so maybe not to the club. Maybe maybe just around the house. I don't know. I would wear it essentially. New Year's Eve, I would wear it. I wasn't crazy about it overall. I kind of wish they kept some of the original dream sequence structure where she like dreams about Judd and Curly, but it was incredibly well performed. I thought that the dancer, let me find her name real quick, was absolutely incredible lead dancer Gabrielle Hamilton. She's insanely good. I don't know how she has that much energy. Like as a former dancer I thought that what she was doing was just so good and the energy that she was bringing to it was really fantastic. So like as much as I wasn't like crazy about it, I was like raving about her. <laughs> So this production is directed by Daniel Fish and he's really kind of re-examined Oklahoma uh, as a story and what these characters mean and who they are and I think he's really with this production he questions is this a happy ending or not because one of the things that's bothered me for years about Oklahoma is that it ends with a murder um a murder or or somebody you know two people in a fight and one of them ends up dead whether that's an accident or murder or whatever it ends with a death but then we're supposed to think it's a happy ending and that feels weird to me like even if this guy is terrible and this really kind of reconsiders whether this ending is happy or not and it also kind of highlights the fact that most of these characters are terrible people um the exception to that is maybe will parker who is a sweet simple baby and i adore him but like curly sucks um he's charming he's funny he's attractive but he also thinks that like the whole poor judd is dead song um kind of illuminates that he's he's like a really shady guy in some ways Lori. I think has her own issues, but hey, she's supposed to be like 17 and like, that's a hard time. Aunt Eller kind of scares me in this. You think she's like really funny and kind of Mrs. Weasley-esque and then all of a sudden you're like, hold on, 
justice isn't happening here. Um, Ado Annie is kind of the worst. Um, I mean, like, I love her and I stand, but also kind of the worst. I think that it just really makes you consider, like, the fact that these are incredibly flawed people. And that's not to say that they're bad characters. I think they're fantastic characters if you admit that they're really flawed. I think that the issue is that so often in Oklahoma, they're presented as, like, good people. And that's, A, kind of boring, but also, B, like, false. <laughs> I also think the way that Daniel Fish builds the tension within this, there's tension between Lori and Curly, there's tension between Lori and Judd, there's tension between Judd and Curly, there's tension between the farmers and the cowmen, as they sing about, there's tension between, I think, even like Aunt Eller and Lori a little bit. Um, and there's also this tension within Lori herself in terms of like she's at this weird age where she's kind of on the cusp of womanhood and she's trying to figure out what she wants in a relationship and what she wants in a man and she's trying to kind of find her own path and that's really difficult and I think that this kind of goes into that a little bit more. You see that like she has a lot internally that she's dealing with, which makes sense. You know, she buys this potion from Ali Hackham and she says that, it, you know, she buys it because it will show her her true desires and she's trying to figure that out and she can't. And so she needs this like help for it. And even whenever she thinks she figures it out, then she, I think, questions a bit if she's right. And I just, I just think that the way that they show all that is absolutely brilliant. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some specific performances now. Will Parker is played by James Davis. He's the most enthusiastic Will Parker. Will is a sweet and simple man, as I said, um, and one of the few people in this that I'm not like, you are kind of the worst. I love Will Parker, I guess. I always loved him as a kid. He's always been my favorite character, really. Like, I wanted to be Ado Annie. Like, that was my dream role, but, and still kind of is. But, like, Will Parker is great. I think, obviously, he's not completely unproblematic, perhaps, but I do think that out of all of them, I'm like, he just wants this woman who says that she loves him to not get with other men if he's not getting with other people, and that's really fair, like, fair enough, all he wants is, you know, someone to be his, like, one true love, and I don't know, I like Will Parker, um, and James Davis, just, his dancing is really great, his singing is amazing, like, the whole, you know, Kansas City number is just really funny and he plays it enough that you you know the whole thing with him like not realizing what having $50 like means and how to keep the $50 so that he can marry Ado Annie and whatever the way that he plays all of it just so kind of like enthusiastic and almost like Mr. Bingley simple um just really works with all of that I I think he's he's doing something great Ali Stroger is absolutely hilarious she's incredible um definitely a well-deserved Tony nomination uh, she's so funny as Ado Annie. I will say that I think that Ado Annie is one of the characters in the show that kind of receives the least amount of nuance in terms of like changes to characters. Like I think Lori is more nuanced, Curly definitely is, Judd definitely is, and I don't know that they've done that for Ado Annie quite as much, but fair enough, they're a bit busy. Um, but she is so funny in the role, and her voice is just great. Like the the I can't say no number is so funny and splendid. Um, that like she's she's really great. Mary Testa is definitely younger than most on Ellers, or at least I think like she plays younger than most on Ellers, because um, I think they're typically played as being like quite old, like grandmother age, which is interesting. Um, but she plays a bit younger, and she's so good, and she's so funny in most of the show, and her voice is great, like she sounds fantastic, but then she really gets some good dramatic action in the last like 10 minutes that I saw it and I was like, oh, that's why you're nominated for a Tony Award. And she definitely deserves it. The entire ensemble of the show is really great, and actually it's quite a small cast. Like, Oklahoma is typically done with a ton of people, and this one, like, you really, you don't have any female ensemble beyond, like, Aunt Eller, Laurie, Ado Annie, and Gertie. Um, and the girl playing her does that laugh, like, so horrifically well. But it, the show really centers around three people, which I think is what it's it's always meant to be, but I think that sometimes it can feel more like it's around just Lori and Curly, but this one it's very much about Lori, Curly, and Judd. Um, and so Rebecca Naomi Jones is really lovely as Lori. I think that some of the songs have been lowered for her, which I love. As someone who is an alto, whenever I did sing, anytime that I, you know, get to hear 
a lead female with a little bit of a lower range makes me really happy but she's just really lovely in it and I think does a really good job of showing that like Lori isn't just this bright eyed ingenue she's someone who like really is dealing with a lot internally and you know is really trying to figure out these feelings that she has for Curly and also figure out what Judd's whole deal is and I think that she does that in a really great way. What Rebecca Naomi Jones does in the finale is really really splendid. Okay, so Patrick Vale's Judd. Um, first of all, Judd is typically played as this kind of like big hulking dude who's very obviously threatening and it's kind of like, well yeah, duh. Um, you know, everybody feels threatened by him, I guess. Um, he's typically played quite menacing. And in this production, Judd feels a little bit more like the weird dude in your math class with a crush on you. And he's, dare I say, <laughs> kind of hot. Um, and like a bass player in a band kind of way. Which I think is a really interesting thing whenever he's kind of sympathetic. I don't know that I'd go as far as to say that he's likable, but I think at the very beginning he comes off as quite sympathetic. Like he's kind of quiet, kind of introverted. He very obviously wants to be a part of this community, but he's kind of isolated from it. He's not as clearly threatening, yet there is something under the surface that's a little bit unsettling, which I think is great partially because that feels a lot more realistic. Like it feels a lot more like the kind of, kind of I don't know, creepy guys that girls have to deal with sometimes. And I also think that he's more sympathetic because it's more obvious that Curly's kind of goading him. He's kind of, um, you know, he goes to him and is like, hey, like I, I bet people would care if you died, which is like, it's, it's bullying. It's bullying. And obviously Judd goes on to do like some bad things. Like, I'm not saying that he doesn't and I'm not trying to excuse it, but I do think that it's interesting that you kind of get more of a sense of where he's coming from, I guess. Um, and it's, it's kind of unsettling because he is so quiet and unassuming in many ways that I just think what Patrick Vale has done is really splendid. And he also has a lovely voice, like his Lonely Room song is incredible. And I, it's, it's maybe my favorite thing about all of Oklahoma is Patrick Vale's performance. So Damon Dano, I think that's how you say it, plays Curly, and after I saw it, I texted a friend and I was like, when Damon does the twangy thing with his voice, I melt. He really, out of everyone, I think kind of is the best at doing this folksy style of Oklahoma that this production has. It's not done in the very traditional Rodgers and Hammerstein style. It's been reorchestrating and kind of redone. So like Curly plays guitar throughout a lot of it. You've got more of like a bluegrassy folks band and the style is more like folk, bluegrass, that kind of thing. It's not wildly different from the music that you're familiar with, but it's different enough to feel new and fresh and exciting and also very much in the style of where it's set. You know, it feels frontier-like. I don't know that that makes sense, but I'm going with it. And Damon is so good at it. He has the voice of an angel, but he also can sound like a legitimate like folk or bluegrass or country artist. And his acting is also incredible. He's so charismatic which I think is really important in a Curly because even as he is doing these things and I think Damon's quite good at playing both kind of the dark side of Curly and the like charming, funny, charismatic side. Also, he has the most beautiful Curly hair. Like, I'm just gonna put it out there. He looks great in a cowboy hat. Like, he plays guitar throughout it and one of my favorite things, maybe my favorite line in the entire show, is when they're singing, people will say we're in love, which is my favorite song, of course. Before he starts his verse, he like goes and picks up his guitar and Laurie goes, don't play the guitar. And that's me. Every girl who has ever fallen into that thing of like having a crush on the guy mostly because he plays the guitar knows what she means. And Damon's so good. He's so good. I'm so happy he's not making it for the Tony. He's just incredible. So speaking of the Tonys, they have these things in their playbill that said eight Tony Award nominations, uh, which are Best Revival of a Musical, uh, Best Direction of a Musical, Best Lead Actor in a Musical, Best Orchestrations, Featured Actress for both Mary Testa and Ali Stroker, and scenic design and sound design, both of which are, or well, I mean, all of those are very deserving. And I am filming this before the Tonys. I'm actually filming this on the day of the Tonys. So fingers crossed for Oklahoma. I do think it's going to win Best Revival, but we shall see. So obviously by the time that you're watching this, they may have won some Tonys. So like I said, I am going to see this again in a couple of weeks. 
Um, and I may end up writing a blog post about it as well after I see it for the second time because I think that it really has something interesting to say to our country right now as we are in kind of tumultuous political times um, and just a tumultuous time right now I think in the world. But let me know if you've seen Oklahoma, if you want to see it, if you're going to see it, if you have any questions about how something is done, I'm happy to answer that in the comments down below. I also just am happy to talk about this, like if you've seen it, let me know your favorite part. A cast album is being released, I believe on June 28th, I am counting down the days. There's a couple of performances that they've done on things that you can find on YouTube, so definitely check it out. But if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up so I know that you guys like reviews of musicals and plays like this. And also subscribe to my channel if you want to see more theater content coming at you every week or two. <laughs> I'm trying to get onto a better schedule soon. I'm about to um, have a bit of an upheaval announcement pending, but I am hopefully going to be producing theater content regularly very soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all of your support and a huge shout out to the people who asked me and requested that I do a review of Oklahoma after I talked about having seen it on social media. If you want to follow me on social media and hear me talk about theater across many platforms, you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16 on just about everything, but I'll also have links to them down below as well as a link to my blog. Thank you again so much for watching and I'll see you very soon. Bye! Don't laugh at my jokes too much. Who laughs at your jokes? That's friggin' rude.